along the embankment where the children are picking up trash will eventually be one of four Little League baseball diamonds. Transforming this empty lot is a community project. All the work under the supervision of the Little League president is unpaid. They work weekends, and they are all volunteers. Little Leaguers, their parents, and members of the United States Army Reserve. Hal Williams, president of the Little League in Falls Township, Pennsylvania. The town gave the Little League 24 acres. Mr. Williams tells how he got the project started. In uh, July of 1970, I met Colonel Fred Welsh from the 79th Army Reserve Command. And he told me that if I would contact Army Reserve, he was sure that they would oblige. After receiving permission from the trade unions and contractors associations, Arrangements were made to start cleaning and excavating an area to provide activities for children of all age groups in a clean and healthy environment vital to their survival. The U.S. Army Reserve, with the men of the 851st, 939th, and the 330th of Philadelphia and New Jersey, are the only source of help we have had outside of ourselves. All of us together, including the Army Reserve, are volunteers. It won't be long now till the kids will be playing ball here instead of picking up trash that the grown-ups have dumped. In anticipation, some of them showed up today with baseball mitts. This is Christopher, and Chris works just as hard as the big boys. Keep trying, Chris, and your throwing arm will improve. What is happening here today is not an isolated instance of the Army Reserve helping out on a community project. For years, its community relations program, now a part of the Defense Department's domestic action program, has combined worthy projects with regular military training wherever possible. This scene is not unique. Cleanup campaigns have been started by responsible people all over America. The Army Reserve helps wherever it can. Here in Cannon Falls, Minnesota, for example, the 205th Infantry Brigade joined with Boy Scouts in a cleanup of the city's river. Soon it will again be a favorite picnic spot for camping and canoeing. Other units have recently participated in similar cleanups in Texas, Arkansas, Kentucky, Idaho, Florida, Iowa, Georgia, and elsewhere. Strength in Reserve is the motto of the Army Reserve, and its mission is to augment the active Army in times of emergency. To fulfill their mission, reservists train constantly. These men are double-duty citizens who have an interest in strengthening the defense of the nation. So it's only natural that they have an interest in their community, too. Meet Sergeant John William Brent. He's assistant to the city engineer, Charlottesville, Virginia. Charlottesville is the home of three presidents. The history and tradition of the citizen soldier, incidentally, go back to the times of Madison, Jefferson, and Monroe. Sergeant Brent designs and constructs sidewalks, drains, and culverts, and his duties include inspection of the various projects throughout the city. Another reservist in Sergeant Brent's outfit is Sergeant John Goodall. Sergeant Goodall is a draftsman and a designer of electronic components. Also in their outfit is Sergeant Al Tinsley. Sergeant Tinsley teaches retarded children in the Charlottesville public school system. It's training night for their unit at the reserve center. The three men are picked up by their operations sergeant, Ernest Annis. Interest in community affairs is a natural one, since the Army Reserve is a community activity. The Charlottesville Reserve Center is near the beautiful grounds of the University of Virginia. 
Reservists live, work, and train in communities throughout the United States. There is no typical Army Reserve city because it is located in so many, both big and small. Although the unit spends two weeks each year undergoing intensive training at military installations, most of the training takes place here at night or over weekends. The reserve center soon turns into a beehive of activity. Sergeants Goodall and Tinsley are drill sergeants and are proficient instructors. And of course, Sergeant Tinsley is a teacher by profession. Once training is underway, Sergeant Brent is able to take care of administrative problems. In another classroom, the unit's first cook gives a class in field sanitation. Some units train weekends on military reservations. This company is part of the 157th Brigade on a training exercise at Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. There are 260,000 young Americans in Army Reserve units. Training is year-round. Using their equipment in snow and ice gives them an opportunity to extend their capabilities. This reservist is teaching a class in infantry patrol tactics in Alexandria, Virginia. The AR. What does AR uh, represent in the squad? Sergeant Bussey? Automatic rifleman. Right. His name is Oliver Brown, and he's the first sergeant headquarters company, 1st Brigade, 80th Training Division. <laughs> Company's form, sir. Many reservists are deeply involved in community service on their own. And Ollie Brown is an outstanding example. He is a policeman, a sergeant in the Washington, D.C. Police Department. And he's been a member of the force for 22 years. He is also director of the Washington Metropolitan Police Boys Club. Uh, in the Boys Club, we have 20,000 youngsters and then we now have nine clubhouses. And in every phase of our work, uh, be it checkers, pool, basketball, we try to teach the youngsters to play by the rules of the game. On the uh, basketball court, it is not just basketball, but it's teamwork with five fellows playing as a unit. And from this, we feel that when the youngsters leave that basketball court, he will begin to live by the rules. Ollie Brown is devoted to getting underprivileged youngsters on the right road to productive future. And he practices what he preaches. Because the Brown's two daughters are away at college, they adopted three boys from Junior Village of the Child Family Service Foster Parent Plan. During the weekends, the uh, members from our reserve unit, those that love fishing, also love to work with youngsters, uh, we combine our efforts with the Boys Club, a local fishing group called Angles All, and we try to carry the underprivileged kids from the ghettos uh, fishing down at Point Lookout, Maryland. Not only does this give a kid an opportunity to be introduced to the wonderful sport of fishing, it also teaches them a wonderful lesson, patience, and also when to grab at an opportunity. The opportunity being when the fish bite, you have to know when to reel them in and, and, and it also teaches them to obey the law. Fishing, like any other thing, you must have laws. Uh, down in the, uh, in the uh, Chesapeake Bay area, you have certain length that you must throw back if the fish, the uh, spot, or the trout fish, or the rock fish, if he's not a certain length, we teach the youngsters that you must throw him back, give him a chance, and then come back next year and catch a much bigger fish. While individual reservists spend many hours on their own helping people in towns where they live, in some cases, entire reserve units are able to combine their training mission with community service. 
here in Hot Springs, Arkansas. A sand and gravel company donated truckloads of material to the County Girl Scouts Council. The sand and gravel is to be used in the construction of a new dining hall for the Girl Scout camp. It is being hauled by members of A Company of the 489th Engineer Battalion, which is constructing the building. A Company has three projects scheduled this weekend, and all of them require the use of equipment that these engineers must learn to use skillfully. Driver training is accomplished as the sand and gravel is carried to the Girl Scout camp in the Ozark Hills. The Girl Scouts watch as the reservists prepare for the pouring of the concrete of the foundation. The reservists work quickly on the footing against threatening skies. The men will spend the night in pitch tents. Tomorrow, the concrete will be poured. This platoon has already completed other facilities for this Girl Scout camp, including a boathouse at the lake's edge. Another platoon on this same weekend is back in Hot Springs, clearing an area for a local orphan's home. enjoy this type of training. Coming out on weekends like this gives us a chance to help our community in doing things for our community, such as the one we are on today. We have cleared some land for the children's home, and it gives our men an opportunity to train on heavy equipment, which we have had out here today. Still another platoon of the 489th Engineers is simultaneously at work on the building of a new running track for the local high school. Draining ditches are dug first. Surveyors check levels. Fill from high ground is moved to the low areas. Other companies from this engineer battalion are spread around the state, and they too work on community projects. In Conway, Arkansas, they have improved a section of road at the request of county officials. In Pine Bluff, reservists have begun a cleanup project in the local park. The men of the 328th General Hospital at Fort Douglas mobilized its members to action when the Salt Lake City medical community announced a rub out rubella campaign. Working together with state health authorities, they planned a full-scale attack upon this dreaded disease, commonly known as German measles. The vaccine was supplied by the Board of Health. They manned 18 different clinics in Salt Lake City. And after two days, they had inoculated more than 150,000 youngsters against the disease. When it was all over, the mothers supplied the coffee and. Contributions to local blood banks are frequently made. Here, the men of the 205th Infantry Brigade at Fort Snelling visit Red Cross headquarters at St. Paul, Minnesota to donate blood. Recently, when blood was needed for a patient undergoing open heart surgery, many individual reservists responded. In communities that have established eye banks, reservists have also cooperated. Units in Tallahassee, Florida signed pledges for the use of their eyes after death, as did the men of the 1st Brigade 80th Training Division in Northern Virginia. After a blood donation, the donor is served fruit juice by Red Cross volunteers. The 748th Engineer Detachment, a forestry unit in Missoula, Montana, trains in all types of logging activities. Working together with the Department of Agriculture Forestry Service, they participate in a process called commercial thinning. 
they cut down less desirable trees to permit the younger ones to grow to full maturity. The reservists then transport the downed trees to their own sawmill. Later, the rough-cut lumber is turned over to non-profit organizations. Some of it was used to construct bleachers and a grandstand for the local Little League. Louisville, Kentucky is the home of the 100th Training Division. The information officer is a citizen soldier who wears several hats. His name is Bill Willis, his rank major. He is a chartered life underwriter. He is also district commissioner of the Arrowhead District Old Kentucky Home Council of the Boy Scouts of America. Major Willis frequently appears before citizen groups, encouraging them to sponsor new scout troops. He is particularly interested in organizing new troops in the heart of Louisville's inner city. Overnight weekend camperees, the boys get tips on living and eating outdoors from reservists who know what it's like to sleep on the ground. While Major Willis is an example of an individual reservist involved in scouting, many units across the nation work with scouts in their spare time. Here, for example, in Sioux City, Iowa, instruction is given in the use of the compass. Scouts taught by Army reservists inevitably earn merit badges for their accomplishments. They work with children of the community the year round, but when Christmas comes, they make an even greater effort. Sharonville, Ohio, is the home of the 311th Field Hospital. Today, the unit is giving a Christmas party for the orphans of a local orphan's home. They carry the boys in ambulances to the reserve center. Lieutenant Colonel Robert H. Poe, Professor of Medicine, University of Cincinnati, is the commanding officer. I was the commanding officer of the 311th Field Hospital at the time of the reserve call-up in 1968. I served as commanding officer for the unit throughout its entire tour in Vietnam, where I placed a great deal of emphasis upon our relationship with the civilian community. With respect to this, we operated a clinic for a local refugee camp. We provided a local civilian hospital with a pediatrician and we had a Christmas party for some orphaned children. We have hoped to continue this tradition now that we are here at home, and our party of today was designed with that purpose in mind. Sergeant First Class Ronald Thompson also served with the unit in Vietnam. I've been a member of the 311th Field Hospital since 1960. I was on the advance party, went to Vietnam in 1968. Our first Christmas spent in Vietnam, we gave a party, a Christmas party, for local Vietnamese children on our compound. We had a Santa Claus, which was represented by one of the men in the 311th, and uh, we had a real good time. Upon returning to the States, this year we gave another party, which was for the orphanage in the local community. This really makes me feel good to be able to be a part of this type of thing, because after all, our unit does and always will take part in community functions such as this.
The American soldier has always shown compassion for children, whether at home or abroad. The men from the 787th Maintenance Battalion and the 376th Transportation Company brought Christmas gifts to children who are hospitalized at Christmas time in Dothan, Alabama. Local merchants contributed some of the toys, and the reservists donated their own funds to purchase more. One of the most unusual projects of all took place in Denver, Colorado. It's a well-planned city with broad streets, boulevards, and parkways. In the 1800s, the town fathers planted elm trees. Today, Denver has 300,000 elm trees. They not only add beauty, but convert carbon monoxide in the air to oxygen. Suddenly, Denver's famous elms were in jeopardy. Many were dying. Many were already dead. The cause? Dutch elm disease, a mysterious fungus that is spread by a European beetle that first appeared in America in 1922. Denver took what action it could. Mayor William McNichols described what the city was doing. We are organizing and are using, at the moment even, a crash program to go pick those trees that uh, we know are infected and take them out. Now, they're not replacing them at the moment, but they are getting rid of the possible source of infection. Uh, there's no cure for this. If a tree has it, the only thing to do is take it down, uh, cut it up and burn it, or bury it somewhere away from the root structures of other trees. The Parks Department is doing the most effective job to fight the disease. They're doing what Dr. Foyt recommends uh, and calls sanitation where a tree that is not infected and yet has dead branches on it, uh, they have to be uh, taken off surgically by a tree surgeon or someone who knows this, uh, leaving no overhang whatsoever. It was easy enough to remove elms that were obviously dying. Was it possible, however, to identify affected trees scientifically before the damage became apparent? The 405th Military Intelligence Detachment had the answer. These reservists are expert interpreters of aerial photographs. They realize that diseased elms would show up as shades of blue on aerial photos taken on infrared film. Colonel Louis LaPerriere, commander of the unit, explains. Basically, there's three types of stress that we come up with. In lay terms, that is a physical stress, which can be done by winter kill chemical stress, which can be a lack of iron in the soil, and of course a biological stress, which means a disease in the tree. Uh, when we look at the trees, what comes out is basically a healthy tree indicates itself in terms of a normal, deep, rich red color. And then when we get one with a biological stress, generally speaking, when we look at the crown, the whole crown will not be discolored, but only a certain number of the branches until such a time as the tree is absolutely dead. The 405th Military Intelligence Detachment took on the project. The entire area was photographed from the air by the Army, and the reservists pinpointed the infested elms on their infrared photos. Today, there is hope that the remaining healthy elms in the city of Denver will survive and prosper. Another example of community service combined with military training. The 369th Station Hospital, San Juan, Puerto Rico, has been long involved in community service. Recently, in conjunction with the Lions Clubs, they gave full physical examinations to the people of a San Juan neighborhood. Announcements were distributed a few days in advance. And early on a Saturday morning, they began to assemble. By 11 a.m., over 400 people showed up. This unit comprises physicians, dentists, nurses, and medical technicians. People in this district of San Juan are eager to be examined by the reservists. Word of a good deed travels fast. 
and is long remembered. If during the physical, symptoms are discovered, the patient is referred to a physician or to a clinic. Hearing of the young is tested. Full cardiograms are made of the elderly. The commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Victor Rosario, MD, supervises all the activities. Word of the work of the 369th Station Hospital reached several young men of another community in Puerto Rico, Hogar Crea, home of creativity. It is a commune of former drug addicts. The staff of Hogar Crea, all former addicts themselves, asked the reserve unit to visit them and give physical examinations to its members. None of these young men use narcotics any longer. They had all neglected their general health in the past. Complete physical examinations were long overdue. Since Hogar Crea is dependent upon citizen contributions and support, they are grateful to the reservists. Again, when members of the unit discover a physical problem, the staff is notified so arrangements can be made for treatment. It's an American tradition, this matter of service, of joining together to help others. Members of the United States Army Reserve are double-duty Americans, soldiers ready at all times to back up their nation, and concerned citizens ready at all times to volunteer their time and their services to their hometown neighbors. When the nation needs them, they leave home and family. 26 Army Reserve divisions in World War II, 969 units in Korea, 75,000 reservists during the Berlin Crisis, and in 1968, 45 Army Reserve units were called to active duty, 35 of them served in Vietnam. Yes, the men and women of the United States Army Reserve have a long and rich tradition of service to the nation. And it stands ready now, ready to defend America and ready to help their communities. <laughs>